Thank you so much, Teresa. Gosh, what a beautiful uh, introduction. Oh my gosh, I'm so honored that you asked me to talk for this workshop. You know, you're one of those winners. And um, yeah, I am, um, and I'm happy to see uh, some of my girls on here and friends and uh, just welcome everybody. I wanna welcome the new people. I also wanna welcome people that are have a lot of time. And if you're carrying secrets, if you started doing something you know you shouldn't or you stopped doing something you know you should be doing, you know, this, uh, it, reach out and talk to somebody. This is the deal. We, we don't want to lose you 20, 30, 40 years. We don't want to lose you. And uh, we can't stay sober on yesterday's sobriety. So uh, I just always throw that out there because I had time. I uh, had almost three years once and uh, I had almost two years once and almost three years once. But then I've seen beautiful, beautiful souls go back out even with 40 years. So it's it's wild. It's uh, and and that's not to scare the new people. Like I said, they either started doing something or stopped doing something. And that's what we do. And um, so uh, my name is Hillary Roberts. I am an alcoholic. I've been sober since May 9th of 1997. And I'm very grateful for that. My sponsor is Polly P. She has a sponsor. My home group is the Pacific Group in Los Angeles, California. I travel between... Dallas and LA when COVID's not going on. I go to the Chicago group on Wednesday nights in Dallas, Texas. Uh, and then in, when I'm in LA, I'm at the uh, Pacific group. So super grateful to be here. You know, I, I chose this reading. Um, I was thinking about how I always felt like I didn't belong anywhere. And it started very, very young. And when we, I, I, I came into AA when I was 15 and I memorized all the words and I could spout off a bunch of good stuff, but I couldn't stay sober. And the thing was until I got a sponsor that told me to read the big book and the 12 and 12 with my heart and not my mind, then I had a chance. She said, how am I like this? How does this relate to me? She said, I want you to get it into your spirit, get it into your heart. And, uh, and so then as we study this literature, as we study this, these textbooks for life, what happens is, is it really gets in there and starts working a magic. You know, there's sentences, you'll hear old timers talk about it or elder statesmen, whatever, people have a lot of time and they'll say, oh my gosh, I never read that before. Because <laughs> it's a constant process of growing. I'm gonna just read the paragraph that this comes from for the people that aren't familiar with it and, and hopefully it'll refresh some of the people that are familiar with it. Perhaps one of the greatest rewards of meditation and prayer is the sense of belonging that comes to us. We no longer live in a completely hostile world. We are, we are no longer lost and frightened and purposeless, purposeless. The moment we catch even a glimpse of God's will, the moment we begin to see truth, justice, and love as the real and eternal things in life. We are no longer deeply disturbed by all the seeming evidence to the contrary that surrounds us in purely human affairs. We know that God lovingly watches over us. We know that when we turn to him, all will be well with us here and hereafter. Now, this past year of everything that this world's been going through, this paragraph is so good. It's good for us at any time because, you know, I think about the pandemic and how people said they couldn't leave the house. Well, heck, when I was drinking and drugging, I couldn't leave the house at all anyway. I couldn't leave the, I couldn't leave the closet or the bathroom, you know? I mean, I was in my own quarantine. <laughs> the only time I leave is to go get more booze or drugs or find, or a manip go manipulate a way to get more booze and drugs. Um, I'll say a little bit of my story. I mean, this whole thing about the God thing is really my story. All I can tell you is that I, uh, you know, I, I haven't listened to this workshop before, so I kind of don't know where to start, but what I, what I just, I'm just going to just start with what I know. And what I know is that my experiences that I, that I grew up in may not be the same as your experience. Like my sponsor never had any of the stuff happen to her that happened to me. Her parents never divorced. None of that stuff happened. And all the things that I went through, 
she was cherished, she was loved, she became alcoholic. And for a long time, I thought if you had the childhood I had, if you had the parents I had, you would drink like I do. And um, that's just not the case. What happens is I take the drink, the drink takes me, and I end up in places where I don't wanna be with people I don't wanna be with doing things I never in the world thought I'd end up doing. And I do that over and over and over again until I can have a complete psychic change that's outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous through the 12 steps. And cause I can't stop because in between those drinks, I, I, I emerge remorseful. And then what happens is, is that I start having these old ideas. Maybe I can have one, maybe I can have two. You know what? I won't have more than three. You know what? I'm not going to have Mad Dog this time. I'm going to have some uh, something really classy like Cold Duck. <laughs> Actually, I might even start with a little champagne. I'm going to do it high class, maybe some red wine. And there I go. And I end up in the places doing the things that I would do. And, and it just was, it was over and over and over again. And I almost died over and over and over again. Um, I can tell you that for me, my story is that I was sexually tortured and abused starting at age three by different perpetrators. Um, <laughs> I, um, I really didn't believe there was a God. Um, then when I was 12 or 13, I started to get to know some, this kind of God. My dad was atheist and he got in my face and said, you know, who are you to believe there's a God? And then I was abused again within the church. And then I gave up on God again. And see, I believe God existed. I just believe that he was a maniacal evil, you know, uh, God that was like, hey, 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 a little, like I'm his marionette doll that he was going to do evil things with. And that's what I felt like, you know, and uh, I took my first drink when I was 14 and a half. I, 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 I was really smart growing up, but all the chaos and drama that I grew up in uh, turned into uh, just where I couldn't handle the world anymore. And when I was 14 and a half, I was repeating the eighth grade. Um, these big girls brought out a bottle of tequila and they said, hey girl, you wanna try some of this? And more than anything, I wanted to be accepted because I did not have that sense of belonging. I did not have that sense of belonging. And so, you know, I'm drinking it. I take that first shot. I'm going to be cool. And I'm coughing. They're, co they're laughing at me. I got to laugh. I got to be cool. And you go down eight, nine shots later. And this girl that was so insecure about her red hair and her freckles and her pale skin, this, this girl that, um, this girl that even though she ha was given a voice at age 10 after seeing the play Annie, and would get just about every part that she auditioned for, but she did it because she couldn't stand her own name. She couldn't stand who she was and she would sing so she could escape who she thought she was as a bad person. I always thought I was bad. I always thought that I wasn't worthy. And so when I got on that stage, I could be somebody else and I could be somebody because me was never good enough. Me was never good enough. And so there I am and I, you know, I remember I had this brain before I took those drinks that wouldn't shut up. It's like that neighbor that's upstairs with the loud music that you can't stand. And you're like, tell them to be quiet. You're knocking on the door and they just crank it even louder. And, and it's just all these voices. I know what you're thinking about me and it's not good. And I know what I think about me and it's not good. And, oh my gosh, uh, what did I do to make that abuse happen? And why is dad going to flip out again on me tonight? And, and you know, is mom going to leave again? Cause mom left for several years and, was she going to leave me again? And was I adopted? And <laughs> I wasn't adopted, but I thought I was. And then I had a cannon sized blast of anxiety, you know, where I'm just, you know, I have just never a sense of calm, never a sense of calm. And I took that, I took those drinks and eight, nine shots later, my brain gets quiet. Eight, nine shots later, that cannon blast in my gut seals up and becomes warm. And I remember I had this warm feeling and I'm like, you know what? These girls are really smart to invite me to their little shindig. And secondly, I'm really kind of cute. I kind of look like Anne Margaret or Maureen O'Hara. I used to watch those old movies. I loved it. My whole thing was I was going to marry one guy, like my grandparents got married. He's going to marry one guy, have kids, have grandkids, and then have us die on the same day. 
That was my dream. <laughs> and I always thought my life could be a Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers movie or, you know, one of those old romantic movies. And that's what I wanted. And, you know, my best thinking and my best drinking got me at 16 years old, pimped out on the street, almost dying over and over again. And, and, uh, two months later, I ended up, uh, he beat up his favorite girl. They had, they had conned and manipulated me out of town and said they presented it as something totally different than what it turned out to be. It was supposed to be something that was going to be great for my career. And, um, I was scared to leave because anywhere my mom lived, he beat her to, to a pulp. He wouldn't let her go to the hospital. And he was always worried about me being underage. And I told him the FBI and my parents were looking for me, which wasn't true. And he let me go home. He said, go home, go home. You don't need to be here anymore. And uh, I can tell you, um, I believe I would be dead right now, not from alcohol, but from one of those people on the street. And um, anyway, but so now, now that I've done that now, not only was I unworthy and unlovable and a piece of garbage before, now I'm a totally a piece of trash and scum and nothing but a carcass to be used because now who will love me after I've done that? Who's gonna love a girl like me? Who's gonna wanna be friends with me? I'm dirty, I'm disgusting. And it's like, I have an A on me and worse than an A. And um, the shame was overwhelming. And the only way to get away from the shame and the pain was to, it was to continue to drink, to add more things to it, uh, stuff that would keep me up for days and um, take me to other places where, but I could drink, drink, drink for more long, longer periods of time. So when I finally, finally got to you, I, like I said, I came in and out, it's too much to get into, but when I finally, finally came to you, I had lost my singing voice, I had ruined not one, not two, not three, but four major record deals because you can offer me the love of my life on a silver platter. You can offer me the career of my dreams. You can offer me the self-respect, which I've really never knew what that was, the respect of my community. I really didn't know what that meant. Um, the respect of my family, I didn't know what that meant, but you can offer me everything I think I want and I'll pass it all for a drink. And it's always at the worst time. And that's the kind of alcoholic I became. And it's just kind of like I was a basketball bouncing on the bottom of what they call the bottom. And it was, there was no lower to go except for getting locked up for life, going totally crazy um, or dying. And those old timers with what, like one tooth in their mouth, you know, with five billion years sober, they'd be like, darling, if you don't go crazy and you don't die, and you don't get locked up, we're gonna get you. <laughs> Happy as a lark too, man. <laughs> it's like, and I'm looking like they're crazy. So, you know, and I'm gonna do everything but take the steps. And that's why I kept going in and out. The other thing I would do is pretend like everything was just fine. You guys had asked me how I was doing. Oh, I'm great. Just got out of the hospital after almost dying from overdosing and drinking too much. Just got out of the hospital from getting a hole in my lung. I mean, you know, cause I'm doing all those repetitive smoking repetitive. I'm just crazy town over and over and over, but I'm going to pretend. So the difference was this time that I came to you, I'd lost my singing voice and uh, I was 12 step out of a strip club by another stripper who actually had gotten our program. And uh, I was, you know, I, it takes a miracle of God to get me out of that place. I, but I remember I used to tell her to control her drinking and then there she was, she had six months sober and working in that place. And I'm like, how are you sober girl? And she said, well, on page 100 of my big book, it says if I have a good business reason to be here, which I do, I'm here to make money. And I was shocked, but interested, you know? So, so I, uh, but then we started going to meetings, you know, I could hear her. I could hear her. And we started going to meetings and I just, uh, I, I started going to these meetings and she invited me down to Texas. You don't have to change cities for this to happen, but I was going to meetings with her and I made a decision that I am not going to pretend that everything's okay anymore. There I was 93 pounds sunken in cheeks, kind of a greenish tinge to my skin. I've been, you know, I'd been in the mirror picking the heck out of my skin over and over. It just, it was not a pretty sight wearing clothes. You could see through. Yeah. Getting up four or five, six times during the meeting. Um, 
you know us. <laughs> and um, I started interviewing sponsors and uh, I got a sponsor that would, would not be interviewed. But anyway, so I'm going to the meetings, I made a decision and I, but I would, I told everybody, I always had a burning desire at every discussion meeting, I had a burning desire and I would tell them, I hate you, I hate God, I hate me and I hate AA and I don't wanna hear about it after the meeting. And they'd be like, keep coming back. And I'd be like, two fingers in the air. <laughs> and I remember they would try to hold my hand for the prayer and I'd be like, get your blankety blank hands off me. That thing doesn't give a blankety blank about me. All right. Well, you want to go to lunch? And I'd be like, y'all confused me because as mean as I was, which of course I'm like the Skeletor in the, in the corner, right? But as mean as I was, you guys were just like, okay, well, we're going over here for lunch if you want to come. And, 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 and then I started slowly opening up and, um, and I remember some, you guys are wild. You guys just don't care. You guys would be like, Hey, Hillary, just come with us. You know what? We'll, we'll buy your, be your, buy your lunch. And I didn't want to be accountable to anybody. Cause then you owe somebody something, you know, and you guys, I'd be like, no, no, I don't want to owe you any, owe anybody, anything. And you guys be like, no, you just pay it forward later. I'm like, I don't want to owe anybody anything. Come on, let, let me just put some, you know, and you guys would just talk me into it. Y'all just like worked me. You worked this. <laughs> um, so I got this sponsor and uh, my sponsor, of course, I knew I was powerless and over alcohol. I knew all that. My sponsor said, you're going to take the steps one through 12. You've never finished the steps. You've always stopped at four and eight. Because see, they said I had to make amends to my dad. And I said, I will never make amends. He didn't believe the abuse when I told him that these people were abusing me. Well, that was just one of them. And then, and then he... Uh, you know, kicked me out of the snow, out of the house in the snow with no shoes on. I'm like, he, you know, he took money that my grandfather left me, it's just all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm never doing that. And uh, that's how my feelings were until I got my sponsor. And I still had those feelings, but I was willing to listen to her more or less. She says, you're going to take these steps one through 12. You're going to call me every single day. You're going to call three women every single day. You're going to go to the meeting after the meeting every single day, and you're going to go to one, two, three meetings a day uh, or more if need be. You're going to pick up the phone before you go take a drink because I was famous for call, you know, calling remorseful after the drink. Um, she told me, I want you to get on your knees and pray to the God of your misunderstanding and ask it to keep you sober. And thank it at night. And I'm like, do I have to call a God? She said, no, I don't care what you call it. So I called him MFSOB. We got into my steps and uh, my sponsor told me, she says, okay, I want you to write your powerless and unmanageability. That was easy. I knew, I knew that. And then of course you heard what my, for my second step, you know, she had me reading the big book. Well, she had me reading the book anyway, the big book for the whole, all of the steps. And she had me reading two paragraphs at a time with my heart, not my mind. And that, cause that was all I could probably handle. <laughs> and I had to get a dictionary from 1935. And so like, to look up all the definitions, you know, I had listened to Joe and Charlie tapes. I mean, I knew my book. I just couldn't stay sober. <laughs> I knew it here. But um, so the second step, you know what my concept to God was. We go to the third step. She said, okay, if you could pick any God, any God, what would it be? I said, well, I'm not picking a light bulb or a doorknob like they talk about. I mean, I thought that was always so ridiculous. She said, okay, well, what would it look like? And I said, okay, sponsor, because I'm not people pleasing anymore. I'm not trying to get you to like me. I'm upset. I can't figure out why I can't stay sober. This is crazy. And I'm angry about it. I'm angry where my life has gone. I'm scared I'm never going to sing again. They told me they didn't know if I was. I felt like such a loser. And I mean, like, I'm like, what is there to lose? What is there to lose? Well, why am I going to pretend to be happy for you people? <laughs> so I, um, I told her, I want to, I want the big book talks about, I'm going to, to feel the nearness of my creator. I want to feel the nearness of my creator. I want to, um, I want to laugh from my gut. I want to, um, I want to know what it's like to sit in a meeting and not be disgusted with the topic gratitude while you guys all laugh. I want to get what that is. And even more than that, I can't stand the topic acceptance. And I don't want to want to rip my hair out listening to these topics. 
I want to feel like I have the secret to life. I want to feel like I'm not below everybody. I want to be able to take a shower, one shower, and feel clean instead of taking 20 showers and I can never feel clean from the inside out. I want to know what it's like to be able to look in the mirror, put my makeup on without being just totally disgusted by the sight I see in the mirror and, and not feel like such a piece of trash. I want to know what it's like to feel my innocence. I want to know what that is. I want to know what it's like to hear the birds singing, to see the butterflies, to be so excited about the little things in life. What is that like? She said, that is what I'm talking about. That's a third step. And so then she, <laughs> it always messes me up. Just thinking about it. Um, then she had me get right to business. We, we did that third step prayer and she held my hand and we were on our knees and I just didn't want it, it was so uncomfortable. The other thing she did is put her arm around me in the meetings and I was always like cringing because you know I didn't want anybody touching me. I felt so gross about myself and she always gave me so much love and, and I didn't understand it. And the women, the women, you guys that wear the most ridiculous outfits and you guys would just like tell, invite me to your houses and you would love me in spite of my freaking booty shorts and all the weird stuff I'd wear. <laughs> And, um, anyway, she had me start writing that inventory and it was, you know, I had to write down everything and I had to write a prayer at the top of every page. And that's the way my sponsor did it. And I had to get all my resentments out and then I had to do my part. And she told me, she says, Hillary, I don't want you to get so angry that you go back out and drink. And I don't want you to despise them or you. You're just going to write the facts, step outside, write the facts. And that's what I had to do. So I had to write the facts. This is what it is. And I had to ask her questions and I'd go up to the AA club and I, and you can't do that right now, new people, but you can get people, you know, where you can say, Hey, can I call you in an hour after I'm done writing? And I'll take a little coffee break with you. You can do that right now while you're doing writing. And um, if you get a community of people that you're calling, you can do that and just check in with people every 30 minutes, every hour, every 15 minutes, whatever it takes. If you're feeling like drinking, call people, Pick up that phone like it's like you're taking a breath, you know? Um, and, and so then I remember writing out the fears and then we had to write out this, I, we, me. And then I had to write out the uh, sex inventory, which was really, really hard because I didn't remember all the names, you know, and the pain and the shame there. And I had to really step outside. And I really remember crying my way through that with my sponsor. And I would, I remember, um, I would, <laughs> I put some makeup on to go to the meeting. And I remember also I, I was starting to dress better and I bought some stuff at the secondhand store and I looked nice and I felt like my insides didn't match the nice clothes and I would start crying. And she would tell me, she would have to walk me through, like turn on the shower, call me when you get out of the shower, brush your teeth, you know, put on your makeup now. Okay, you look, you felt pretty in this before. So I want you to put it on and you're gonna meet me at the meeting. And um, so, you know, it was that kind of thing, you know, cause of all the shame and feeling so disgusting about myself. And so I wrapped up that writing and, you know, I got a big bag of M&Ms and we did five hours of, in, of uh, fifth step because it was my first one, you know, and, and as we're talking, you know, she says, honey, you are not to blame for what happened to you, but I will tell you that you're not going to like what I tell you, which is you're going to have to pray for those abusers. And, uh, and, and so we went through everything. Now at the end of my fifth step, at the end, there's more to that story, but I don't have enough time to tell you. But um, at the end of that fifth step, I didn't feel like the clouds parted and the birds started singing. But I'll tell you what I felt is that one person on this planet knew me. And every time I saw her at a meeting, I'd start crying because I felt like I, she knew me. She loved me. And she stood up for me too. There were several women that had an issue about where I was still working, which took a minute for me to let go of. And I don't have enough time to get into that right now, but she stood up for me. And uh, she always told me, she says, if God doesn't want you in that job, you won't be in that job. She says, it's my job to take you through the steps. People, you know, had you quit and go work at every other job. I'm not going to do that. You're not to drink no matter what. You're not to drug no matter what, commit suicide or homicide, no matter what. And God will prune the rest out of you. And uh, if it's his will. And uh, so she, um, that's, I felt like I had 
more belonging, that sense of belonging. And let me tell you what was starting to happen. And remember, I told you what I called him. In my step three, I started writing in my journals, dear blank. Because I'd write in my journals, the dear MFSOB. Then in my third step, as my third step and the fourth step came, dear blank. That's what I could do. So we got to a better place. Then I go and I do my six and seven at the house and I look at my first five propose, proposals and I do all that stuff. And my, my sponsorship line, they write out who you're to make amends to. And I, had, and I have to follow the exact instructions on what that looks like. And so I ended up uh, making amends to my father who added more to it. And I um, made amends to my mother for things I had stolen from her and paid her, and I rebought and paid back and did things and um, made amends to my older brother and my little brother for putting him in predicaments and stuff. My little brother was five when he saw the cops come to the house and just things like that. And so I'm starting to make these amends. And what's happening is in step seven, when I'm, when I, when I'm writing out the assets and defects that my sponsor has me writing in six and seven, I start putting dear HP and then as I'm making those amends, as I'm making those amends, I'm starting to write in my journal, dear G-O-D, getting closer here, getting closer. Then I started getting girls to ask me to sponsor them and I started sponsoring women and I started having to do 10 steps and I had to start memorizing prayers and I started you know, going to churches and doing stuff there. And I was still very confused about a lot of things. You know, this has been, a, it was a very slow process for me. I am, um, but as I was doing those amends, as I'm continuing in the steps, the more I'm making amends, the more I'm feeling like I can look the world in the eye and our book talks about that. The more I'm feeling a sense of belonging, the more that I, uh, I also started doing 12 step calls at 30 days sober before I ever took a step. And let me tell you something. When the, it tells us in our literature, even the newest of newcomers will find joy in helping his fellow sufferer. And I'm paraphrasing, but that's so true. And let me tell you, there's not such a, a, a influx of, of treatment centers and detoxes that they don't still need us. We have tons of alcoholics that still need us. Now, mind you, we gotta be safe about it with masks and taking people with us and all this other kind of stuff but it's life changing to do actual 12 step work. Um, I, I made amends uh, about six years ago, I was in Denver, Colorado and my best friend's dad had molested me and uh, he was sent to court for molesting three 12 year old girls. And uh, he got a year probation and they sent my mother $2.99 restitution for harm done. Six years ago, I'm back in, in Denver. I had drank over that situation for many, many years. And I drive up and I see the same car that used to be in front of this house. Because we moved around a lot. I went to like 13 different schools by the time I was in eighth grade. And I was always in inner, inner city schools. I was always a minority there. That was also, I was always very envious of the beautiful African-American women, the Latina women, the beautiful Asian women, all that smooth, exotic skin, the exotic look. Again, I didn't want to be anybody. I wanted to be anybody but me, right? And uh, there's that car rusted out. And I something's driving me to go up to the door. And I knock on the door, no answer. And I try to walk away and I can't. I have to go back up the stairs. And I push the doorbell. And he comes out this other entrance. And uh, I asked if she was there. You know, I'm in my 40s. She, she would be too. I mean, why would she be living with her dad? He said, oh, she lives out of state. And... Uh, and he says, oh, by the way, what's your name? And I said, my name is Hillary. And he, and he just dropped his head. And he said, you must have hurt for many years for what I did to you. And he's shaking his head. And he had this disease where he couldn't grow hair on his body. And he's telling me what a piece of garbage he is and how awful he is. And I grabbed his hands and I said, I forgive you. And he's going on and on and telling me what a piece of trash he is and how awful he is. And I hug him and I say, God forgives you. And so do I. And let me tell you something, we talked for an hour. I told him about me being suicidal at different times, ending up on the street, all the stuff that happened to me. And uh, 
he said, please don't ever kill yourself. He says, I'll pay for whatever therapy you'll need. We talked and I found out what had happened is that they had kept an eye on him. They said, if he messed up just a little for 20 years, that he was going back to prison for a very long time. I didn't know that he lost custody of his daughter who had finally reached out to him four years prior to me getting there. And I walked out of there and I called Polly and Polly said, baby, you're free, aren't you? And I said, Polly, I'm free. And I wanna tell you something. I wanna tell you some other miracles that have happened. So at, I remember at a year and a half sober, my sponsor was telling me, I, my voice wasn't coming back and I was crying about it. My singing voice would not come back. And she said, why don't you ask God to bring your voice back if it's God's will? And I'm like, oh, God, 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 God. Everything you say is God. And she goes, exactly. <laughs> And of course, our deal was I didn't have to like what she said. I just got to do it. So I started asking, going, you know, and then within three months, you know, I got more serious with the prayers. And within three months, my voice started coming back. And then I started singing. You guys started, you guys started asking me to sing at your weddings. You started to asking me to sing at your anniversaries at your parents' funerals, your siblings' funerals, God bless your kids' funerals, you know, just different. And, and the public started asking me and my life started changing. And I will tell you that one of the things that I had to do at six years sober is I had to go get outside help for the abuse that I endured. I was still having nightmares my first six years sober of being attacked. It was every single night, my first six years, first six years sober. I've never heard of anybody having that problem, but I had that problem. And it was, um, it helped me a lot. I was able to get the whole thing, the whole story out in front of my dad and in front of the rest of the family and it helped me. And I met Polly after that. And I had a little bit of acting out after that. And then I was able to cut ties with all of it. And Polly had told me, honey, I love you. I'm, I will never leave you, but I wish you could see me, see you like I see you. And if you did, you wouldn't be able to do some of the things you do. And I have to tell you guys, this, this has been a whole journey of seeing what the value of who I am is. You know, our steps are about getting rid of who we're not. That outside help is about getting rid of who we're not. And I could not let myself off the hook. I even picked abusive relationships. I would meet got nice guys, but I would choose the ones that were verbally and physically and other in other ways abusive even up until three years ago and I've got 23 and a half years sober and I'm telling you because some of us are slow some of us and I remember Polly being scared to death with the with the last two that I dealt with because one of them was threatening to have me murdered I mean it was just awful it was awful. And uh, I would always choose the sickest, sickest guys. And, um, you know, I had to go heal some more stuff in me because what I realized is, is that I still had a core belief in me that I, that what good man would love me, what good man would respect me after what I've done. And then I was told by my sponsor that it was arrogant of me to think I knew more than God, that if God is forgiving and loving and God is everything, who am I to think I know more than God? Wow. And I had to go do deeper step work with Polly. And we did that. We did that. And it was painful. And the withdrawal from that last toxic relationship was awful because it triggered all this stuff for me. And I know that word's not in the book, but I'm just telling you what it did to me. But there's, I was suicidal with double, double digit sobriety. And our book talks about getting outside help. And let me tell you, let me tell you some of these miracles, man. You guys loved me and respected me before I could see what I was worth. Let me tell you about belonging. You, you included me when I felt so excluded within myself. You included me. Um, taking these steps in order and doing everything my sponsor directed, not always well, but doing that, it gave me new purpose and new meaning. An alcoholic wants to have purpose and meaning. Why do we do commitments and meaning? Because it, 
first of all, we have new people do it because the brains are so crazy. You guys need something to do. I know I did. I needed to clean it back in my day. We cleaned ashtrays and I did all kinds of stuff. Clean the bathroom. I'll clean the bathroom today. Give me a toothbrush. I'll clean the bathroom. I don't care because I love Alcoholics Anonymous. See, that's what happens is, is I take the steps. My life becomes an amazing miracle. I have five minutes. Thank you so much. My life becomes an amazing miracle. And then I want to give back all I can to this amazing program that has saved me. I want to tell you some of these gifts, though. My father, my father and I, who had a tumultuous relationship, my father now calls me his hero. And he's my number one fan, he says. My brothers say I'm a miracle and I'm their hero. My mom lives in Dallas. And it's not always easy. You know, I've had, I had a couple of slips with stuff and, and, and I finally had to realize I have to stop looking to my mom to get mommy stuff that she can never, could never, and will never give. I've had a lot of you step in and be moms to me, big sisters, safe men that have been stepped into a dad role. You, I've had so much love. Like Polly says, nobody's loved more than me. Polly says that all the time. I feel that nobody's loved more than me. And, um, I finally had to let my mom off the hook and she's here living with, with my stepdad who has dementia and I get to do and do things and take, help take care of. And I do stuff for my dad and do stuff for my brothers. And my, my job is to be the best sister, the best daughter, the best friend, the best closed mouth sponsor that I can be. Let me tell you something that I've learned. Cause I had a sponsor that did tell all my business back before I, you know, when I was going in and out, that for me as a sponsor, I don't take it lightly. No matter what, I need to make sure that I am careful with my girls, that I'm a closed mouth understanding friend, that I guide them and do my best for them with love, compassion, and firmness at times. And I have a responsibility because those are little lives in my little hearts in my, that God has bestowed to me. So let me tell you that 11th step, I'm seeking those prayers, I'm doing this stuff. And then I started writing that dear heavenly father. And let me tell you some miracles that have come true for me. I look in the mirror and I see a, a, a girl, I see a woman today, a happy woman, a joyful woman most of the time. <laughs> and I say, because I have certain trials and low spots that come along, but I have an unshakable foundation for lights. That's in our 12 and 12 in the 11th step too. So I have an unshakable foundation for life. I look in the mirror and I see the precious daughter of a most merciful God that was so broken and hurt and did the best she could. And I forgive her. I love her. And I think she's absolutely precious and lovable just the way she is. I take a shower and baby, I feel clean from the inside when I, before I even step in that thing. I might be washing off some dirt, but I'm clean. I'm renewed, redipped, rededicated, baby. I sit in a gratitude meeting and I, you know, now today to make all you newcomers vomit, I'm a grateful alcoholic and a grateful member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Most of the time I can take the acceptance one, but sometimes I still can't. <laughs> I feel like my innocence has been given to me, restored if you must, and probably raised to a better level because I am such a little kid. If any of you are on my Facebook or any of my stuff, you'll see me doing just crazy kid stuff. I do faces in the mirror, laugh at myself. I play with my dogs and I'm silly. My license plate says yay. And I swing on the swings at the playgrounds when they don't have the dang tapes put around them from COVID. <laughs> and um, I... Uh, I go outside and I can hear those birds singing and I love it. And I can see the butterflies and I get to help these precious women that God has given to me. And I respect myself today. And let me tell you the last three men I've, I'm dating someone right now. I dated a man for a few months, beautiful man in the program. He had to move out of state and I wasn't moving. Anyway, I was, it was just, he moved away. I met an, I, I dated another beautiful man in the program and it didn't work out for us, but it wasn't because he was a narcissist or an abuser. It just didn't work out. We're still friends. He's a beautiful, beautiful, amazing man. And today I'm dating a man that is a beautiful man. And I don't know what's going to happen. I'm really enjoying myself. He is too. And 
there have been no red flags. There have been no red flags for him or for me. And we're just, we're doing great. And, you know, today I know that I'm worthy of respect and love because I'm a woman of dignity and grace and playfulness and fun and excitement. And I love Alcoholics Anonymous more than anything. And let me tell you something. The only thing, I've been given a lot of gifts. You have given me my voice. You've given me beautiful miracles in this life. You've given me beautiful miracles in this life. But the greatest miracle you've given me is 5-9 of 97. That is my date. I own that date. God gave me that date. Voice or no voice, man or no man, career or no career, billboard awards, no billboard, whatever. Whatever it is, health or no health that I, uh, my greatest, my greatest desire, and if I can do this, it will be the best thing I've ever done, is to die with that sobriety date, being a member in good standing in the middle of the herd of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I thank you for my life, my sanity, my joy, my peace, my unshakable foundation, and I love you so much.